I will say it, I'm in school now and sometimes it's difficult for me to, you know, be here all the weeks, um, but I try my best. I was afraid of kids crying or like the communication thing and, you know, all of that. The parents, I don't know what, what I was, will be able to do. You're always wondering if you're going to be good enough and I, I don't know that I'll ever get rid of that. Am I going to say something that's going to uh, move people aw away from Christ. I was always too busy. Uh, I, I, uh, I own a small business that can really take up a lot of your time if you let it. I, I guess the best way I know to describe it is like a Pandora's box of, of uh, things that I did not want to get into. I felt like I would be like inadequate or I wouldn't like, you know, be able to connect or relate with the girls or I wouldn't be spiritually ready to do it. Being in a group of like leading just sounds like intimidating. Am I like spiritually there to like lead a group of girls? People come here that have never been to church before. And I get to walk through that journey with them. I get to love on them, show them that, uh, that God is about love. Sometimes I have bad days and I just come and serve and that, that changed my mood, that changed the way I say things. And I'm grateful more than, than worried, you know. I made a really good connection with a student that had a disability and God revealed to me that, you know, this is something that he would actually want me to do in my career. So I changed my major from elementary education to speech pathology because of a student that had a disability and God revealing that, like, he's gifted me in working with students with disabilities. I serve to make a difference. I serve because it makes me a, a better person. I serve because we were made to serve. Those are the heroes. Those are the ones that make it happen every weekend. Those are the people. I love them. And I just thank God that we have a church where there's a place for everyone. There's a place for you. You know that? I know you think, well, it's a big church. They, they don't need me. Yes, we do. There's a place for you. And today and next week and the final week after that, we want to talk about this theme What's in it for me? How many of you find yourself asking that of your family or a salesman or something? Somebody's trying to sell you something and you go, well, what's in it for me? Anybody ever ask that? Raise your hand. It's okay. It's, it's, it's not a bad necessarily. It can be, but it's not a bad thing. So let me tell you, first time I heard it. I'm not going to tell you how old I was. Let me just say I was way under age to be driving. Okay? And so I waited till mom and dad were gone, and my brother was gone, and my sister was already out of the house, so I didn't have to worry about her catching me. So I invited my friends to come over, and we're going to take a ride. And man, we took off, and we had a great time. And when I pulled into the drive, my brother was standing there. And I looked to my friends and said, Y'all need to leave. This is not going to be good. So I get out of the car, and I said, what are you doing here? He didn't answer. I said, please, you can't tell mom and dad. You can't tell them. And the next thing he said, what's in it for me? <laughs> what's in it for you? And I heard that over and over throughout my life after that. What's in it for me? I'll never forget it. So when they said, let's have a series called What's In It For Me, I had a flashback. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, no. But you know what? That is not necessarily a bad thing. What's in it for me can be a very selfish thing. Did you know that according to Barna, 50% of the church, now this is the evangelical church, 50% of members say they never intend to serve. I don't understand that. Maybe they're asking the question, what's in it for me? With a selfish attitude. I don't know. I think it might be they don't understand what's in it for them. Because there's another side of that. What's in it for me? More than you could ever imagine. In fact, I can't describe what's in it for you because it's more than you would ever dream. 
Now, that's what I personally believe about serving. I believe it's the one time when you look more like Jesus. And it's the one time when something happens that I can't explain. God just blesses you. He just does things that it, they don't make any sense. I'll give an example. There are all kinds of ways to serve, okay? So giving is a way of serving. After the service a minute ago, a man walks up to me and he said, David, God has been so good to me. And every time I do this, every time I try to help somebody, God just pours more out on me, and I have been more blessed than I ever remember in my life. He said, here, here's an envelope with a check. I want you to go find some people who need help, and I want you to help them. And so what I did, I took it, went upstairs. He had written me a note inside. I opened it, looked at the note, a $20,000 check. And this is what he said. Every time I help somebody, God helps me. Every time I serve somebody, God does something for me. Guys, there's more than you can imagine that happens. Because Jesus himself said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if Jesus didn't come to be served, neither do I. I can't live that way unless I think I'm better than Jesus. Because if anybody ever deserved to be served, it would be Jesus. So I say, you know what, Jesus, if you came to serve, then I know what I'm supposed to be doing here. I'm supposed to serve. And So I want to talk about a miracle where you know the story of the miracle. It's, it's one of the it's one of the basic, simple miracles in, in the Scripture. But here's the, here's the different thing about it. It's the only miracle told by all four Gospels. And let me explain that. The resurrection of Jesus, obviously, that's in all four Gospels. But the only miracle that He performed on earth that is told by every Gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is the feeding of the 5,000. Now, I'll be honest. I, I just think that's crazy. In fact, when I get to heaven and find Matthew, I'm going to ask him, so why didn't you record some of the other stuff he did? Or John or Mark? Or, because they tell different stories. Wouldn't you think the miracle they would all want to tell is when he raised Lazarus from the dead? Only John tells it. Wouldn't you think it's the exorcism? That's what I'd have been writing about. I'd have been telling about every demon that came out and how crazy it was and how awesome it was. Gadarene demoniac. My goodness, the guy had thousands of demons and Jesus spoke the word and they had to go. I would be telling that story. They don't all tell that story. They all tell one miracle. And that is the miracle when he fed 5,000. What is the deal with that? And I'm going to take a shot at it. I'm going to tell you what I think it is. It has to do with serving. If you've got a Bible, I want you to go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, and go to, down to about verse 30. We'll start reading there. And let me just thank those of you who are online and tell you, yes, there is a party in the courtyard. But the courtyard doesn't do you much good when you're not here. But can I tell you, there's a party online. In fact, we want to send a party to your inbox and so I'm going to tell you right now, and I'll say it again, you need to text the word online to 40777, and you will get a response that shows you how you can serve, how you can be involved, even as a member of the online community, because it's so important that you realize this is not about just being in a building. It's about being a servant of the Lord Jesus wherever you are. Now watch this. Read with me. I'm going to read it. Uh, and you can follow along on the screen or you can just read it in um, a Bible or if you've got it pulled up on your phone, that'll be good. Verse 30, the apostles returned to, to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place. Now, Count how many times the word desolate is used. A desolate place by themselves. 
Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran their own foot from all the towns, and they got there ahead of them. And when Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things, and when it grew late, the disciples came to him and said, hey, this is a desolate place, and the hour is late. Jesus sent them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat and visit Chick-fil-A in Capernaum. Now, that's, a, <laughs> that's an addition to the text I hope you recognize. But Chick-fil-A asked me if I would do that. <laughs> Just kidding. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said, where are we going to go buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them? And he said, how many loaves you got? Go see. Now, in Mark's telling of the story, he doesn't mention the little boy that had the lunch with five loaves and two fish. So we just kind of missed that element. That's John's gospel that talks about that. But he said they went and they came back and said five and two fish. Now, hang on. The loaves were probably just little, almost like a dinner roll. I don't think they were really big loaves because they, they would have been, if that little boy had them, it would have been a personal lunch that his mom packed for him. And I don't think you pack loaves of French bread for your children when they go to, <laughs> go to school. It would have been just a small rope. The fish? Man, I, I grew up thinking, I mean, big old fish, slabs, you know? No. Not an amberjack. No. Not mahi. We're talking almost like a sardine. We're talking a little fish that was very plentiful there, and they would carry them, and they would pickle them so that they would be preserved. Wherever you go, you could carry these fish and eat them. Now, I don't know why anybody would want a sardine. I can't figure it out. People have said, have you tried it? Yes, I have tried one. And I'll prove I've tried it. It's the only food I've ever eaten. You don't, know have to, you don't have to know how to swallow to eat it. It just slides down. I mean, it just goes right down. You don't have to swallow or do anything. And people say, oh, you need to put mustard. You need to put crackers on it. Oh, yeah, give me the crackers, and I'll eat them and throw the sardines away. That's what I'll do. <laughs> but we're talking two little fish. So we're not talking big old slabs. We're talking two little fish and five loaves. And they found them. So look what Jesus does. He commanded them to all sit down in groups, verse 39, on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two sardines, he looked up to heaven. And he said, a blessing. Maybe Jesus could bless the sardines I have to eat. That's the secret. Jesus said a blessing. And then... This is amazing. After he said a blessing, he broke the loaves. He gave them to the disciples to set before the people, and he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were, what's the word? Satisfied. In other words, all I need. That's all I need. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. If you do the math, there were probably 15,000 people fed that day. That's, an eat, that's a conservative guess. Could have been 20. Five loaves and two fish. And every gospel writer said, i got to tell that story. Why? I tell you, I think it's a couple of reasons. Number one, Jesus is more than enough. Jesus is more than enough. They saw something in him that day. He is more than enough. They have five loaves, two fish, and they feed 20,000 people. And guess how much is left over? You see these 12 baskets? 12 baskets full of leftovers. And that connected with them. Because remember the place they were in was it a luxurious place? Was it a 
fertile place? Was it what would they call it? A desolate place. And I just think they saw a glimpse of Jesus that he is more than enough. I can't describe a more desolate place than what we have been through together through COVID, through a divided election, through all the things that have happened in this past year. And it has been a difficult journey. I can add to it what I've been through with my health. Let me tell you, it's a desolate place. But here's what I know. Jesus has been more than enough for me every day of this journey. Every day of this journey, he's more than enough. And I'd be lying to you if I didn't, if I didn't tell you that because sometimes we think as a church we have other things to offer. Listen, we, have, we don't have anything to offer except Jesus Christ. And why is that? Because we believe he's more than enough, no matter what your situation, no matter what circumstances, no matter how desolate, he's more than enough. And the second reason is, is because they got to participate in the miracle. Jesus invited them to be a part of the miracle. I mean, it's, it's amazing. They got to be there. They got to be a part of it. Now, the other miracles, they weren't necessarily that involved. They're watching the exorcism. They're seeing it all happen. But in this one, they were involved and I personally believe it was that serving aspect. It was that aspect of, man, I got to be there. I got to, I got to hold a basket that changed their life. And I'm telling you, I believe it is the reason that all four gospel writers wanted everybody to know. is because it changed their life that day. And I believe that change starts with first, and I just remember these three things, the attitude of serving. The attitude of serving the disciples first answered the question to Jesus, hey, we don't have enough food. You need to tell these people to go get food somewhere. That's a very typical attitude for most of us. Well, we just tell them to go get it somewhere. They need to go get, take care of themselves. And then Jesus said, no, you take care of them. You get food. You know what the difference in that is? One is sometimes we have an attitude of scarcity. We live like, oh gosh, I don't know if we're going to make it. I don't know if there's enough this. I don't know if there's enough that. Can I remind you who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Who is walking with you every day as the creator of the heavens and the earth? It's all in his hands. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And instead of living in an attitude of scarcity man let's live in an attitude of plenty of abundance jesus came that we might have life and life abundant and the other part that i think makes the difference in these two attitudes is jesus felt compassion for these people those opening verses he says he saw them and they they appeared to him as sheep without a shepherd and he had compassion, and, and the word for compassion is a word that I like to talk about because it's, it's just a cool word. In Greek, it's the word splankna, which means your guts. It means your bowels. I mean, it means just stuff inside of you. So what is that? how does that translate? Jesus felt it way down here. Can I just tell you, until your heart's in it, you're not either. Until you feel it in your heart, you'll never be in it. But when somebody touches your heart, when somebody moves you deep down inside, you're going to find a way to help them. And I just think compassion sometimes is missing, and that's the number one reason to serve and do something is because we feel it. Because when you feel what Jesus felt, you want to do what Jesus did. And so Jesus saw him, and he had compassion. He says, we got to feed him. And then the action of serving. Attitude is, I, I, I got to do something. The action. So I got a question for you. How many did Jesus feed that day? How many people did he feed that day? Anybody remember? You said 20, 15 or 20? Somebody else? <laughs> All of them? <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's, that's good. It's wrong, but that's good. <laughs> nope. Nope. 
There you go. Jesus fed nobody. The disciples fed them all. Could he have fed them? Well, sure he could have. My goodness, we're talking about a man who caused quail to fall out of the sky. Quail hunters, how you like a hunt with Jesus? That'd be pretty cool. I mean, he caused quail to fall out of the sky, and he fed the whole nation of Israel. He could have just snapped his finger. He could have waved his hand, and everybody was fed. But he didn't do that. He looked at the disciples and said, feed them. So guess what? Every disciple got to be a part by serving. They got to be a part of what Jesus wanted to do that day by serving. All they had to do was pick up a, a basket of some sort, however they carried the stuff. Now, you remember, how many, how many loaves? Five loaves, two fish. Now, if I'd have been one of the disciples, and I'm out there handing food out, I'd say, hey, go easy, eat some hush puppies or something, because they, they ain't got a lot here. <laughs> I mean, I would be trying to say, we got to make this last. we got to make... They just kept serving and serving and serving. And 15,000 people or 20,000 people ate because disciples joined Jesus in serving the need. And I know you're sitting there going, but there's a lot of things I can't do. I can't do that. The disciples, we're talking about a bunch of guys that, I mean, they're fishermen. There's a tax collector. There's a zealot. And all they had to do was pass a basket. So what we've done, we've made serving this privileged group. We've made serving, well, you got to know what you're doing. No, you don't. I promise you those disciples were looking at one another saying, do we hand this out? They didn't know what they were doing. They just simply followed what Jesus said. And I think that's the most beautiful step you can take today. Say, Jesus, I don't know about this. I'm not sure what I can do, but I'm, I'm going to do it. And then he does the rest. He does the rest. So that's the act of serving. Now the result, it's unbelievable. Every one of those disciples never forgot that day. They never forgot that day. They wanted to write about it. Remember, it's the only miracle told by all of them. Matthew was there. So was John. And I think Peter may be the source for Luke and for Mark. And every one of them wanted the world to know, man, we were there. We saw this, and we watched Jesus take fish and loaves and feed all the people. And we got to be a part of it. Their lives were never the same. And people got fed. And the need was met. You see, I just think that there's so many things that God wants to do through his people. So here's a question. Paul David Tripp talks about this. And I don't know if you've read Paul David Tripp or any, heard him, ever heard him, but he's, he's a brilliant, brilliant leader. He said, when you see a person or you see a situation that you want to get involved in or you want to help, here's the question you ought to ask. How can I be a part of what God wants to do in this person's life? How can I be a part of what God wants to do in this person's life? See, we have the attitude, oh, I'm here to save the day. No, you're not. You're not going to save the day. God will. And he may use you to save it, but you're not there to save the day. You're there to participate with God. And so the question is, God, how could I join you in what you want to do in their life? And then God shows you. Because see, he's got this. And can you imagine if every follower of Christ started asking that question? Can you imagine what would happen if all of us started living that way and, and trying to, I mean, we would become more like Jesus, which is another result of serving. You become more like him. Josh is right. We talk about it all the time here. You're never more like Jesus than when you're serving. And I just think that would give him great glory if his children became like him and asked him, Jesus, what can we do to participate with you to change our world? And the good news is he's doing the changing. We just get to do 
simple things like passing a basket. And so I just got to know today is, are you willing to do that? Because there's a word that's used in the text that says, and they were satisfied. Did you see that? Satisfied. Let me ask you, what kind of place were they in? A luxurious place? No. Desolate. But they were satisfied. You want to know how in 2020 I spent every day satisfied? Because of him. You want to know how you can go into 21 and spend every day and every week satisfied, fulfilled in him? If you're looking to the world for the satisfaction, you're looking for that job promotion, you're looking for that next relationship, you're looking for that gig, you're looking for whatever it is, I'm telling you, you will spend your life trying to be satisfied. And I'm convinced Jesus is still more than enough for every one of us. When I was in Africa, I um, was in this shop, and I saw this. It's actually a bill, a currency, $1 million on the bank, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. And we were in South Africa, which borders Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is the old, is the old Rhodesia. And I, I looked at it, and the guy saw me looking at it, and I said, is that real money? He said, yeah. He said, you want it? I said, do I want it? It's a million dollars, man. Yeah, I want it. He said, you can have it. So I picked it up, and then he looked at me and goes, it's worthless. He said, you see, a bill is only good as the bank that writes it, a bank that values it. And the Bank of Zimbabwe went under due to corruption in leadership, and therefore all the printed money now has no value. Can I ask you to do something about what the world promises you? Would you ask the question, is this really something that you can deliver? Because the value of that promise is totally up to whether that can be delivered or not. And I can't tell you how many texts I've gotten recently that the IRS is after me. If I text and return that and I click on that site, they're going to save me. Or I'm going to be late on a, on a prize that I've won. Are you guys getting these texts? I get one every week. It's almost every day. It's like I'm missing out on so much. And every time I'm with somebody and I show them, they say, please do not click. Do not touch it. Why? Because they can't deliver what they promise. I only know one who can deliver what he promises, and his name is Jesus Christ. You will never be disappointed. You'll never be dissatisfied. So if he's asking you, do this, I promise you, I can tell you what's in it for you. More than you can imagine. More than you could ever imagine. In fact, let me show you. It's simple. It's simple. Have you ever done something that you could call serving? Now, I don't mean showing up for your job. You're doing it because they're paying you, okay? I'm talking about something that was above and beyond. Just maybe it was somebody at work, somebody on the side of the road, somebody at church, or in a ministry you got involved in, working with children, working with whatever, and, and you, you did something that you would call serving. I got a question for you. How did it make you feel? What's a word that would describe how you felt after you did it? And, and online, I want you to put it in the chat. I want you to light up the chat with words that describe how you felt after you did it. In the room, give me a word that describes how you feel after you do something that is called serving. Satisfied, what? I heard free. What else? Joy. Great. Blessed, fulfilled, thankful. thankful. Well, let me ask you this. Would any of you say surprised? Meaning you didn't realize it was going to be that much fun? Yeah? Okay. Would any of you feel awkward? Yeah. I, let's just be honest. 
I, there are times I feel awkward. If, if I'm helping in the three-year-olds, I'm going to feel awkward the whole time. <laughs> I, I'll still be blessed, but I'm going to feel awkward. We've got to get over this thing of, well, I just don't feel it. Look, obedience is not because you feel it. It's because you believe it. The feelings will come later. But listen, to the words you use are words, I don't, it's more than I could imagine how blessed I feel. So I did something this week, and I had that same feeling. Dawn, down here that works for us, I mean, she is a great volunteer. She works in the technology world and has been for a long time. She now works for a ministry called Matthew's Hope. It's a, it's a homeless ministry out in Winter Garden, and we've worked with them before, and I know them pretty well, but I hadn't been with them in a while, and Dawn invited me a couple of weeks ago. She said, won't you come check it out again? It's, it, a lot of things have changed. And I go out there, and I start walking around, and they start showing me. We were there. I had a couple of pastors with me. We were there for about an hour and a half or two hours, and I was hearing the stories of homelessness. And I was looking at a shop where they were redoing furniture and building furniture and looking at a grocery store they ran and looking at all this stuff. And, and, and when I got to the end, I said, can I pray for y'all? And they said, well, yeah. Yeah, we allow prayer here. <laughs> I said, well, good, because I just need to pray. And guys, when I bowed my head and started to pray, I just started weeping. I couldn't even put a word together for that prayer. And then I finally gathered my composure and, and prayed. And I walked away, and I'm like, why am I such a baby? Why did I just start crying? It was just a circle of people. And I'm telling you, the Lord told me, you're crying because you saw the difference serving can make. You're crying because you saw what happens. So I'm, I'm here to tell you, and it's not just it was Matthew's hope, it's any serving. It's when you invest your life in the life of somebody else, you are looking just like Jesus. And you get to participate with Him. And today we want you to do that. And you say, well, I don't know if it's going to matter. I, there's so much more coming next weekend and the next, next weekend. You're going to meet somebody that in this church... As a young married adult, somebody talked him into serving in the eighth grade. Okay, he wasn't eighth grade. He was serving the eighth graders, all right? They talked him into it, and he said, oh, I was scared to death. I thought they got the wrong person. I don't need to be doing that. And he went, and he began to serve in the eighth grade. You know what he's doing today? He's pastoring one of the largest churches in Florida. And he said, it all started at First Baptist Orlando when I stepped up and said, I'll go the eighth graders. And it changed his life. I just believe there's so much more that God wants to do through us. And he's inviting us to join him. So can I just pray for you right now? Father, I, I, I want to thank you for every person that's online in this moment. And they're, they're wondering what they can do. Lord, I pray you're going to use us to show them and to help because I, I believe you're inviting them to participate with you. And in this room, Lord, I know there's opportunity for every one of us. So, Lord, bless this in Jesus' name. Now, look this way a second. If there's somebody in the room or somebody online and you're really, your life, you're not satisfied, you're still looking, can I recommend the only one that's more than enough? His name is Jesus. And if you don't know him, if you've never given your life to Christ, I want to, I just, I beg you, it's where it all starts, is the one who created leftovers when he fed 20,000 people. And you put your faith and believe him and say, Jesus, I'm following you. Watch what happens. There'll be leftovers. You'll have more than enough. And then if there's somebody among us that's not doing anything, I just think he wants you to do something. And we want to help you. So what's in the courtyard? We're going to have a party in the courtyard. What's in the courtyard is an opportunity to 
see people that, have, that are serving. It's made a difference in them to see opportunities to serve. And it's just for you to walk through. It's not a commitment between now and Jesus coming, all right? You don't have to sign your life away. It's just an opportunity to say, well, I might try that. And you know what? If you try it and it's not working, there'll be something else the Lord will show you that may be better. I just believe he's looking for somebody who's ready to join him. So if you're looking at me right now going, what's in it for me? Here's my answer. More than you can ever imagine. So now we're going to go to the courtyard live. Josh is going to tell us what's happening and what's waiting on you. Let's, let's listen, Josh. What's up, First Orlando family? I am outside in the courtyard. We are ready for you. I have kids people here. I have guest services people here. I have students people here ready to answer your questions on serving. If you are online, text the word, on, talk, text the word online to 40777 for more information. Again, if you're on campus, come outside. We're so excited to see you. Thanks again for joining us today. Have a good day.